my, my dog is walking around. Okay, hopefully, there we go. I see it. that successful. Okay, so welcome everybody to the 15th ANR Science Slam brought to you by the Science Advisory Committee. Um, bringing scientists together since 2016. Um, a big thank you to Joanne Garten and Casey Kathan, the SAC co-chairs for making this happen. So thank you very much. Um, this is a little agenda for today, um, just showing the different talks and the different people, and I'll just let everybody introduce themselves as we go. Um, I am Julia Boyles with the EC Vermont Geological Survey, and I will just get started. So today I'm going to be talking about the Cottonbrook landslide and delta monitoring. And just a quick shout out to some of our partners and collaborators. Um, Norwich University, University of Vermont, and VTrans um, couldn't have done this project without them. And this photo, we're, sh um, we're looking south, and this is the landslide surface as of 2020. Some background information. This is the Waterbury Reservoir. Here's the Waterbury Dam down here. Our landslide site is here where that little drone icon is, and the Cottonbrook Delta is here. I'm just showing you the map of the state. So just some background photos. The upper left here can show two trees, and we have this big block over here that's about to come down, the slumped block here. This is the landslide toe deposit. So this is just material that came off the landslide itself. This is the Cotton Brook. And here's two people for scale. Here I am pointing to the remnant of the Foster's Trail. Most of it here you can see has just been completely lost. Here I am with Brad Greenow um, and we're standing near the edge of the landslide surface. This is again that toe deposit here. And here's George Springston of Norwich University. You can see here's the trail and some slumped blocks here and for scale. So we've had two drone surveys conducted by the VTrans UAS team. So here they are doing their thing. So this is on the Delta site and then the rest of these photos are on the landslide site. So a big, big thank you to them. So here are the drone photos themselves. On the left, here's the landslide as of June 12th, 2019. This was shortly after it occurred. And then on the right, this is 2020 in late August. So as you can see, just over a year later, the landslide has widened considerably, especially in this area here, you can compare. There's been extensive rilling and gullying. In this photo, there was a big impoundment of water here. There was, a, you can see a little bit through the trees that has since broken through in this photo. And again, this is all, this area here is all the landslide toe deposits. All of these down trees were in this big area here. Just some, some other views. Again, these are, thank you to VTrans UAS. So here we are looking at the landslide surface in 2019, just a different angle. Now we're looking south. Here we're looking upstream. So this is the landslide surface here. And this is the tow deposit. And then just to give you a sense of scale a little bit. So here is the bottom of the tow deposit and those are people. So it's pretty massive. And here's the Cottonbrook Delta. So on the left, June 12th, 2019, and on the right, September of 2020. So these are at the exact same scale, these photos. So you can see that the delta has just widened and gotten a lot, lot bigger. Um, again, thank you to VTrans for the drone photos. Um, and down here, we've noted that, sorry, um, the reservoir level is essentially the same in these two photos. So this is not due to water change. This is just due to deposition of material. And just some more photos showing um, just an oblique view of that 2020 Delta, another view. So down Waterbury Dam is out here. Um, here I am with George Springston. Um, we were conducting some field work 
And then this last photo is just showing you that they're uh, the boulder deposition, so it had really high stream energy to bring these things out onto this delta surface. And this photo, you can kind of see that circular area of boulder deposition over here. And that is all I have. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. And we will move on to Catherine. Hello, all. Um, I'm Catherine. I'm out of District 3, Forestry District 3. I work for the for FPR. I'm a forest recreation specialist up there. Um, so I'll be talking today about trailhead register data and climate change um, and what we can learn from historic trail register data and climate change data to help us inform rec management strategies going into the future. Uh, I'm working on this with Ali, uh, who's our climate forester, um, and it's still in its nascent stages of idea to reality. So register boxes, you've probably seen them. Hopefully you've signed into them. It's how we count who's using our land and we use it to get funding. Um, so this is where you might see one at a trailhead. And then this is what it might look like, date, name, number of people, etc. cetera. Uh, and just so you all know, that's my supervisor, stewardship forester, Jay Nuremberg, holding it down over in D3. Um, there are approximately 10 trailheads in D3 with registers. I've highlighted them um, with stars. Uh, so this is Camel's Hump State Park, and then this is Mount Mansfield State Forest. Uh, these two stars, oops, those two stars are um, like Underhill State Park and Stevensville. And then these are all ways to get to the summit of Camel's Hump. And this is for the long trail. Uh, the earliest data that we have are yearly counts from 1988 at six out of the 10 trailhead locations. Um, but Allie and I are going to be digging into the data that's starting in 2011 because we have um, monthly tallies, which are easier to possibly link to historic climate data. Um, so why are we doing this? One, I took the, NI the free NIACS Climate Change Adaptation Workbook online course. So it kind of started really juicing, juicing the brain up here about climate change and recreation. Um, so we know that recreation use is increasing. We know that climate change is predicted to influence visitor choices. Uh, we have access to historic register sheet data and historic climate change data. Um, we have access to climate models that predict into the future, as well as a great survey that was done by Bess Perry, specifically in Vermont State Parks, about what visitors might choose to do in light of climate change um, based on five factors, which include precipitation and temperature change. Um, and this is a great opportunity to build climate change into our recreation management planning now instead of just reacting to it as um, events occur. Um, these are two um, charts, graphs, sorry, I forgot the word, from um, Best Perry's work um, and it just shows one of the reasons that we're interested is rainy days per week drastically alter what people said that they would um, do as well as if temperatures are higher and both of those things are predicted in climate change um, and so how this links to helping think of recreation management is if we know that people aren't going to come when it's super rainy where can we distribute money like does that mean that they'll be at a different location will they be just at lakes so that could help us think about like where best to um focus our managing energies um and then we're in the nascent stages of analysis so as i mentioned earlier uh so we're exploring the trailhead data right now Je we plan on generating descriptive statistics um, and then we're going to decide what other statistical analysis will help us answer our questions. Um, we're meeting maybe like once a month to talk about this because it's a bit of a side project. Uh, then we're generating a list of potential climate variables. So things that we've thought that might be of interest are uh, seasonal precipitation, the total number of days, one inch and two inches above normal precip, snowpack in winter, extreme minimum and maximum monthly temperatures. Um, and we chose these because they're of interest. We think we can get that data. And also they link to Best Perry's um, findings um, around temperature and precipitation. 
Um, so it would be nice to sort of um, see what people have done in the past compared to what they have said they will do in the future. Um, and that's it. I might have gone too fast. I was so worried that I would run out of time that I sped through. So hopefully I did not um, speak so fast you couldn't understand me. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions at the end. Um, and I will stop presenting. Hello. Let's see. Hey, Charlie, we can hear you. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, you can see it. Cool. All right, make sure you cut me off if I keep going. Oh, the clock is buried. I got to find my phone so I can see my clock. All right, 11, 12. So I have seven minutes, 18. OK, so my I'm going to talk about something that has a little more of a personal note in it, but also relating to my um, work and hopefully something I think that you all might find interesting. It's been really interesting for me, and so I thought it'd be something fun to share. Um, and so you can um, I'm Charlie Hone. I work for the wetlands program. I draw wetland maps and do wetland monitoring, go into wetlands, collect data, a bunch of stuff like that. Um, you can see a map there, um, which is Cornwall Swamp. Um, and so I know while we were all home during the pandemic, we all learned all kinds of things about ourselves and or our relationships or our families or all kinds of great stuff or in some not so great stuff sometimes, but I actually learned a lot during the pandemic and um, I learned a little bit about how it is that I do things differently than a lot of other people. And a lot of you maybe have come by and seen me at my desk looking at something like this that's just like, what even is that? Uh, I don't understand that. So I throw these into presentations and people be like, what? Uh, okay. Um, I think they, but when I look at this, I can see it's a delta with a river and a wetland on the left. So I was like, oh yeah, oh, obviously it's a delta. And then I color all my numbers too. So here's like some analysis I was doing. I, I look at the numbers. And I'm like, I don't know what a number is, you know, but then I color it and it's like, boop, oh yeah, there you, now I can see the correlations and stuff. And so, um, and you know, I'm out in the field and people are asking, oh, hey, hey, you know, a lot, a lot of People don't actually ask me if, why I can't tie my shoes because they don't really know that. But um, and I can do it. It just takes a while. But, um, you know, I've got a very irregular skill profile or spiky skill profile, as they call it. So, um, you know, basically, I know what a million plants are, but I kind of get wonky in meetings and can't sit still and I can't remember numbers at all. That's why I've got that color coding stuff like that. So it's just like, well, what gives? You know, I never really bothered to figure it all out. I love this comic because it's like definitely me. Um, but so what I learned was that I'm autistic. I'm on the autism spectrum. And I didn't realize this because I had had a misdiagnosis as a kid, but in retrospect, it's pretty um, clear. Um, but it's all, it's very different for everyone. So if you're like, well, but I know someone else who's autistic and they're really, really different from Charlie. Yeah, they, they probably are. And, you know, it's really, really broad and diverse. Um, and I use autistic instead of on the spectrum because in the autistic community that I've connected to, people prefer that, but I don't have strong, it doesn't bother me either way. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of good stuff too. There's also a lot of stereotypes that I believed, and that's part of why I never figured this out. Um, uh, anyway, so when I was a kid, I, I really kind of dug into childhood stuff. And this topographic map in the background of this is something I drew when I was like, I don't know, eight or 10 or something. I would just compulsively draw these maps when I was stuck in um, classrooms. And I have like hundreds of them, right? I, I tried to hide them, but my mom saved them. They thought I had Tourette syndrome because I was doing lots of bouncing and making sounds. And um, but it turns out it wasn't Tourette syndrome. It's called stimming. It's a, a repetitive, often repetitive motion um, that autistic people tend to make. Um, and actually, I have a bunch of childhood videos on YouTube. I'll link later. I don't want to. I better keep moving, though. Um, so, yeah, it actually has some really beneficial parts. I have, you know, I, you don't realize until you start talking to people that not everyone is perceiving things the way you are like I kind of I don't have full on synesthesia where I like look at the color orange and it smells like like chicken soup or something. But I have um, a little bit of that kind of blending of senses where I can be driving down the road and see a white pine tree and I can almost like smell the tree and feel the tree as it passes by. I'm like, oh, white pine. 
So like, oh, I thought everyone could do that, but maybe not, or maybe, maybe so. I don't know. A lot of it, a lot of it's intuition level. So a lot of it, I don't even realize I know why I know what I know, or I don't know what I don't know what I don't know. And um, I've got a really, really good memory for maps and for places. I can visualize what all these different wetlands look like pretty much exactly. And if I, if my map drops in the water, I don't get lost. Um, and I remember all kinds of, and that's why I remember plants too. Um, and I have a, a way of seeing color that I can visualize stuff. Um, and I do really well outside. You know, none of the um, downsides affect me that much outside. But there are things that are hard, too. And, um, yeah, I, I do struggle in the office environment, but not in the stereotypical sense. I'm not the guy who, like, hears a sound and gets upset. It's kind of the other way around. I'm really sensory seeking. And the combination of, like, the air conditioner noise and the lack of other stimulus kind of gets me all wiggly. Um, especially in meetings and, but also alternatively, I, I can't really regulate my voice volume, which everyone loves in the office. And I used to be really sensitive about it because I wasn't trying to be loud. I just am. Um, but now I'm trying to understand that's just kind of how my brain works. And if I'm doing like the, for some people, the stimming is like, you know, different hand flaps and wiggles. And a lot of times for me, it's like making little sounds like I'm like, while I'm mapping and everyone's like, what is that noise? But I don't even know I'm doing it. Um, it's, it's actually kind of pleasant to me, but it might irritate others. So it's now fine, now that I understand it, to knock on my cubicle. So I choose something else. Um, yeah, I don't remember numbers. I can't even really remember my wife's phone number, which is the opposite of the stereotype, right? Um, I'm not good with names. I'm not good with logistics. I'm not good at when plans change. And, I, you know, they say people on the autism spectrum can't be sarcastic, but the I'm not great on the phone thing is kind of a sarcastic overstatement. I am horrible on the phone. Um, I know I'm talking too long, so I'll go quick, but neurodiversity is just this idea that there's this broad suite of brain types and, you know, the average person, if not that there's such thing, falls kind of in this, this central realm. And then there's all these other people with all these other different things they can do that make them both, you know, stronger and weaker. Or that's the wrong word. They're just, just different. And so the idea of neurodiversity is that there's all these different things. It's often used to refer to the autism spectrum, but... Um, it also relates to ADHD and ironically Tourette syndrome, which I thought I had, but no, and dyslexia and a bunch of other stuff. And with the spiky skill profiles, it means, well, I'm really bad at some stuff, but I'm really good at some stuff. And a lot of people just really struggle, but I'm just lucky. I have these amazing coworkers in this amazing workplace where people have tolerated my weirdness and gotten excited about what I'm good at. So, you know, it's really in a lot of ways been a benefit, but I just never really drilled into it. Um, and anyway, yeah, I, just wanted to say thanks. And I like talking about this stuff. So feel free to talk to me about it. But just know that everyone's really different. And all my opinions, all my experiences are very unique to me. So if you feel like what I'm saying does not resonate with you, um, and you are also neurodivergent, because I know there's a lot of us in this field, then, you know, share if you want, don't share if you want. I don't, you know, try to figure out people's diagnoses, because that's rude. Anyway, um, thanks so much. I know I went over. So Thank you, Charlie. Okay, next up we have Savannah. Sorry, I just had to mute myself. So can you see just my slide? Yes, we can. Title slide, great. So hello everybody, I'm Savannah Ferreira, Forest Health Specialist with Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Today I'm going to talk about red pine decline and how our forest health team has established and sampled monitoring plots this summer. So red pine, Pinus resinosa, has been in a state of decline across Vermont. This decline started maybe in 2008, maybe a little bit before, it was only ever casually observed and honestly inadequately assessed. Early hypotheses alluded to a combination of climate change and the invasive red pine scale as being possible causal agents. In 2019, a declining stand was sampled in northern Vermont. This sampling showed that there were several shoot blight pathogens as well as insect stressors present. So to try to determine if this declining pattern in fungal and insect complex was homogeneous across the state, 12 red pine monitoring sites have been established during the summer of 2020. 
So 12 sites were established on state land and were divided among four geographic regions. Due to time, I'm not going to list them out, um, but they're shown here in the red dots on the map. At each of the 12 monitoring sites, four permanent plots were established, the plot design being a fixed radius 35 feet with approximately 120 feet between plot centers. Initial observations were made on Red Pine in 2020, and this is what's going to be continu continued to be monitored annually. This includes the percent of uncompacted live crown ratio, the percent of crown density, the percent of dead shoots and their location, as well as the percent of crown transparency and needle discoloration. So this year, 10 out of 12 sites were destructively sampled. Felled red pine trees were micro sampled within the symptomatic branches in the canopy using a sterile bone marrow biopsy tool and symptomatic needles were harvested from the canopy. To look at tree growth, cross sections were taken from diameter at breast height, DBH, and base of live crown, BLC. All plant tissue was then brought back to the forest biology lab to be processed. So although we only just started this project in 2020, I do have some results to share. So first, we can look at a table showing our crown metrics per region. And this is compared to a standard asymptomatic open grown red pine. If we average all our regions together, the average crown density for our destructively felled and sampled trees was 46%, which is 4% less than our standard. The average dead shoots were 21%, which is 11% higher than our standard. Average cr crown transparency was 37%, which is 7% higher than our standard. And average discoloration was 15%, which is 5% higher than our standard. So our fell trees were less dense, more dead, and more transparent than a healthy or asymptomatic open grown red pine. So fungal pathogens that were observed and isolated from both needles and vascular cambium tissue this year was Diplodia pinea and Soida polysepora. These pathogens cause shoot dieback, necrotic cankers, needle discoloration, and needle dieback in infested hosts. These pathogens are currently thought to be native and opportunistic in nature, meaning that they're going to be present at low levels, but will increase in population and damage when conditions favor fungal growth, as well as when conditions favor tree stress. In addition to fungal pathogens, we also observed several insect stressors this year, which included the pine needle scale, pine gall weevil, and sawflies. Luckily for us, red pine scale was not observed at any of our sites, although other New England states have been reporting red pine scale as a causal agent of their decline, mostly in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Although insect damages did not seem to be the causal agent of our decline, their presence, big or small, is going to influence overall tree health and vigor, and is going to help predispose trees to fungal pathogens. In addition, it's possible that any or a combination of these insects could vector fungal pathogens between and within hosts. So sampling also included collecting DBH and base of live crown cookies. And I just wanted to show you one example of one of our sites. Um, as you can see, up almost until 2000, this tree is growing pretty steadily, but it starts to dramatically drop off starting in 2001 and continuing until 2020 when it was harvested. I mean, if you can look here, there's less than one centimeter of growth over that 20 year period. Now there's many abiotic factors that could have contributed to this decline, and I listed a few that are notable here on the slide. Um, but the main takeaway I want you to get is that all of these abiotic weather events that could have impacted the tree is going to cause tree stress. And this is going to predispose it to both insect and fungal biotic stressors. So in summary, red pine is continuing to decline across the state. This decline pattern seems to be a combination of abiotic and biotic factors, which include severe recent droughts, as well as insect stressors and fungal pathogens. In setting up these monitoring sites, we hope to better understand red pine health and future management across the state. Oops, sorry. And we'll take questions at the end, so I'll stop.
Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Sauls with Fish and Wildlife, and uh, just a little lag in my program here, but I work out of the Essex district. And I uh, just wanted to go over some of the funding that we do. I'm trying to cover a quick coverage of everything we do with between management and of the migratory game bird program and habitat, but we use a lot of different funds and grants and uh, we get finally get a little bit of general fund money to do the work. Within our district alone, we have three full time and um, three limited service personnel that work with on all these projects. We do a variety of surveys for from aerial surveys of populations on set transects to breeding surveys on woodcock, grouse, um, and other waterfowl. And all of this work goes on within a flyway basis. We work within the flyway of the 17 states and the Atlantic flyway in the three provinces north of us. So the birds don't go um, on those administrative flyways, but uh, we work with those. And a lot of the work that we're doing is to do trend analysis of the populations and looking at models and getting information for those models. As you can see here, Vermont, our resident population is going up, which we don't want it to do, but uh, the surveys we do help us to see if our management effects are changing uh, the population size. The Atlantic population is our migrant bird. You can see we just we work on these up in the tundra and also down in our wintering areas down in Delmarva Peninsula, and we work with our partners on that. Uh, locally, we do some nest boxes and uh, other nesting structures on the wildlife management areas and some private lands that we have permission. And that again is just giving us some easy trend data to kind of monitor these populations as a first first flag, sort of that canary in the coal mine in case something's going wrong environmentally or within our uh, hunting seasons that we have set. Some of the ways we gather this information is through waterfowl banding, and we use a variety of techniques from uh, swimming traps to rocket netting and drives. And then just, just list the variety of birds that we have. And uh, with our small staff, we do a little over 2,000 birds a year. While we have them in hand, we can do some testing. Uh, here we're doing some tracheal and uh, cloacal swabs to test for avian influenza. At the same time, we can draw, take feathers off and do isotope to get origins of the birds. And we can t do some blood draws to do genetics for population studies. It also allows us to do a little bit of outreach so that we can recruit the next uh, resource managers in the future. And also, if they choose not to go into this field, our goal is to help them uh, think about wildlife and the habitats, whether being the engineer or the uh, business person ready to make a, a decision on something that they're going to do. A lot of outreach comes with that. We use our partners, things such as Dead Creek Wildlife Day and bringing in VINs and other folks doing um, landowner workshops on things such as apple tree release, working with school groups, uh, scout groups and college students just to uh, get the information out there. I'm also responsible for the waterfowl hunting within the state and helping to um, give recommendations on seasons. We do have 45 species of ducks, geese and swan in the North America, and we have about 30 of those come through Vermont. So you can see a variety of birds throughout the year. We run a couple of controlled hunting programs, one in Alberg, one in Addison, to provide a recreational opportunity and also to assist us on some crop damage issues. And we do a lot of management, uh, obviously on state lands, wild, wildlife management areas, and working with our state foresters and other uh, specialists throughout the state. With, within doing that, we have a number of dikes and uh, dams that are set up that we can control them with um, uh, water control structures to raise and lower water levels. We also have pumps with some of our tractors to refill these uh, wetland restoration sites from our, some of our reservoir ponds. And we're trying to provide uh, mud flats and uh, feeding areas for shorebirds and wading birds. At the same time, we're trying to grow vegetation for later in the fall. And if, we, as they say, if you provide it for them, they will find it. It's amazing how quickly waterfowl and other birds find these um, areas. We do a lot of grassland management with controlled burns, brush hogging, working with farmers to allow them to take um, a cut of hay off just for bedding late in the year, because if we don't cut it, obviously it's going to grow back into trees here in Vermont or worse yet, a field full of exotics. Also do some forest management. We've done some recently. We do a lot of patch cuts and individual um, tree and group selection cuts on our wildlife management areas. And our goal is always it's wildlife habitat and our income is not a, a priority on that. So if we break even, we're happy. If we make a little bit, it goes back into the land management. We also have volunteers help us with work and some of our old orchards and other activities and just to provide food for wildlife at a different time of the year. Research have map stations mapping avian production and survival where they miss net birds and are doing some banding and some recent work that I've been involved in. Luckily, within the flyway, we're doing a um, 
North to South studies of American woodcock where we're tra trapping them, putting transmitters on them and looking at pre-migration habitat and also migration timing and survival. This is just a map that shows some of our birds from Conte, Missisco, and down in the uh, Buckner Preserve of TNC and where they ended up this past winter. And then we also help graduate students. We've done some trapping of bobcats, radio collaring with GPS collars, and the students are looking at uh, habitat use within the, the state and also you know, urbanization and effects on wildlife. And if all goes well and we get funding, we're looking at doing some uh, net collars with satellite transmitters on Canada geese that are our migrant species to see if their phenology of migration has changed and their populations have been going down somewhat so we're trying to figure out what is going on with uh, possibly habitat use changes and another one is also a mallard study with a backpack transmitter obviously this isn't a um, a mallard but it's a raven but it's the same type of unit and what happens is they'll collect the data and as they come back down near a, a cell phone tower it dumps all that data to us and, and sends it through quickly and then we do some wetland restoration. Obviously uh, taking ag lands is good for out of production, putting it back into wetlands is good for wildlife and also water quality. And also gives us viewing opportunities. Uh, a lot of wetland conservation, that's basically we're trying to protect wetlands by purchasing them, uh, purchasing the buffers around them or protecting them and adding them to wildlife management areas. And these are just some examples of where we've done it within the state. And the primary way we did that was with our state duck stamp money. Uh, hunters are required to buy a duck stamp for $7.50 a year. We put that into a pot and we use the interest to, to acquire lands and to uh, restore them. And more recently, we have the EPA money that's going through the Lake Champlain Basin program and is administered through DEC, where we have uh, several million that uh, uh, people throughout the department are working to do acquisitions and restorations. And obviously, we can't do all of this ourselves. So it's a host of staff around the state and many partners. And that was the quick and dirty of it. So um, we'll take questions at the end. Thanks, David. And thanks everyone for um, these awesome presentations so far. I'm going to be your last speaker. And Uh, hopefully you're seeing my title slide. Yes. Great. Um, so my name is Joanne Garten. I work with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program and also uh, am a longstanding member, now co-chair of the Science Advisory Committee. And we started these science plans back in 2016 uh, with the hope that some of the, the data and presentations that shared would be polished up and, and publishable or, or maybe even published, but also that some would be, um, as Catherine used the word, nascent and under, under development and would encourage some collaboration. So I hope um, you'll, you'll accept that spirit in this presentation on tree equity and Vermont urban and community forestry, a look into the data that we have and the knowledge that we lack. So tree equity is a, a relatively new term to me. It came to me sort of very formally from American Forests, a uh, federal conservation association. And um, it's a, a, these words on the screen here are from American Forests itself. It says a map of tree cover in America's cities is too often a map of income and race. And in most cities across America, trees are sparse in socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods and some neighborhoods of color. This exacerbates social inequities says tree equity is a moral imperative, not just an environmental issue, and trees are more than something pretty to look at or sit under. Much like buildings, streets, and sewer lines, trees are essential infrastructure that improve quality of life. Uh, we've certainly had a lot of resources and support at um, state and federal levels in urban community forestry, looking carefully at um, where our field impact is and, and where it isn't. Uh, one tool that was just released by American Forests is this tree equity score analyzer. Uh, it gets really at the heart of data at either block levels or even down to parcel levels of where current canopy cover is and what canopy tree canopy goals are um, in those areas and relates it to socio uh, or just demographic data, uh, percent people of color, people in poverty, on people um, who are unemployed, the prevalence of children and seniors, and also a basic hot air temperature on, on some of our hottest days when trees are really providing a lot of cooling benefits. So 
Of course, this tool um, is in its pilot stage. We don't have any of this type of data coverage and analysis for any of our census defined urban areas in Vermont. So I went looking a little deeper um, at some data that our program has been using for, for several years, and that's data from the Vermont Department of Health. And what you're seeing on the screen now is a, a, a map that amalgamates a lot of different data to explain a heat vulnerability index by municipality across the state. I pasted on a kind of a more detailed legend from one of the Department of Health's reports about what information is included in this map. Uh, population, socioeconomic characteristics, health conditions of the population, environmental um, uh, uh, characteristics, climate, and, and levels of observed heat illness. And although in this list there are perhaps um, proxies for race, I don't actually see race um, as an actual measurement that was taken as part of this analysis. Um, this isn't my data and I don't know a ton about it. Um, I believe it was last updated in 2016. And again, kind of putting out feelers for folks who know more or maybe have more information um, about how this data is used now. But it's been really helpful to our program and there are many, many maps to look at. I'm going to zoom way into one of the environmental characteristics that's mapped percent cover uh, by forest canopy. So this is kind of a subset within a subset of data that feeds into this larger map. And um, here, some of the darker colors are, are higher percentage of uh, forest canopy cover, tree canopy cover, um, and, and the lighter colors have less trees. And you can see really what's fascinating to me is up in that Northeast Kingdom, I'll kind of toggle back to that um, map of overall heat vulnerability index. You see a lot of those more vulnerable populations up in the Northeast. Um, so it, it's uh, you see also some of the cities popping out there, St. Albans, Newport, uh, Barrie, Rutland, Bennington. It you know it's it's really highlights to me some of what we're being told at uh, these urban and community forestry conferences, webinars that there are many things that trees can do um, to establish better quality of life, health, equity, um, but there are many things that trees can't do, and it's so important to be working with our partners um, in all these overlapping areas in these in these um, towns and communities. So looking a little deeper, you know, this is data at the town, at the municipal level. Uh, what our department, our program has is uh, urban tree inventory data. That's been a project that the Urban and Community Forestry Program has been running for, I'm guessing at least seven years that allows volunteers, municipal staff, um, intern students to do on the ground, you know, foot surveys of urban and community trees in their municipalities. And I have time to just take a closer look at two cities that um, I noted in that heat vulnerability index map. And one is here is Newport City. Here's a outline of the whole city. And you can see first that we have some inventory data only for part of the city, the, the, that downtown area near the water. And there are a bunch of trees there. And as we zoom in, we can see that those green trees are um, trees in good condition, but there are certainly many trees that are in fair or poor condition, or even the red trees are, are dead. And so certainly what tree canopy, um, the condition it's in and where it is and how um, good quality trees are perhaps separately located from dead or dying trees affects uh, the perception of quality of life and even safety in these communities. And of course, all the benefits that urban trees are providing. Um, zoom over to another town. This is St. Albans City, and, and I really love this uh, map. There's tree data everywhere in a very, um, I, I don't know who took the data on this, and it may have been someone who got pretty click happy with those gray trees, which are areas identified as vacant, so that may be suitable for tree planting. And I'll zoom in here. You can see that on one side of the city, uh, there's a lot of trees already there, and the other side, many opportunities for uh, tree planting locations, at least surficially. And I say surficially because we don't know there what um, who the people are. Are they willing and able partners with the municipality to have urban tree cover along their streets? And we also don't really know too much about the subsurface. You know, as important as it is to make room for canopy, we also need to know about soil conditions and integrity for supporting healthy root structure. Um, 
Our urban tree inventory at present has almost 25,000 data points in 35 municipalities. So there's a lot more trees um, to look at in our in our urban areas. Um, but already we note that over 4,000 of them are trees in the Fraxinus genus. And these are our ash trees that are threatened by emerald ash borer. And that's about one in six of our urban trees. So in one sense, you could imagine one in every six trees on your street, um, perhaps not being there after succumbing to emerald ash borer or perhaps taken down preemptively. But really it doesn't roll out like that. A lot of areas are, are planted heavily with ash. Um, I like this picture of, of those seven or eight mature trees. I think six of them are ash, and this will look very different um, in short order when emerald ash borer uh, comes to all the different municipalities across the state. And, you know, really urban tree planting is very, um, suffers a lot from, from some monoculture planting. We see maples, we see honey locusts, but even in our farmlands, um, the, those, that's a row of dead elm in the, in the bottom left corner there. There's a, a lot of impact all the way down to the site health of the site level and the tree species and how they are sitting in relation to climate change and other forest pests and diseases. I'll round out lastly with just a look at who's in our program, um, partly because we're online and it's hard to meet all of you. So should you find any of us, uh, please say hello. But we are five people in, in both Forest Parks and Recreation and University of Vermont Extension. And it's certainly not um, within my personal or professional capacity to point out how we're all different from each other. Um, but I will just say that as you glance across the screen, you'll probably um, see people who appear as female and white. And as a program, we're really diving deep into what that means for the type of data we collect, the people we reach, the people we aren't able to reach, or the people who don't see us, um, and thinking carefully as a group about how we're collecting data and how we're using it. And as a last slide, you know, one of our, our most impactful programs each year is Energy Saving Trees, which is an annual tree giveaway that so far we have been able to um, work with the Department of Health to identify some particularly heat vulnerable communities. Uh, private homeowners are given trees to plant in parts of their property that will um, shade their homes and reduce cooling costs and heat related illness. And this year we'll be in Newport and Bennington. So I think I went a little too long, but we still have about 17 minutes for questions. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Julia, and open it up for questions. So it looks like we have um, a few questions in the chat. Um, I'm just going to kind of scroll up to get oriented here. So just a big shout out to Charlie. You're, you did a wonderful job. Um, I see Emma has her hand raised. So let's just start there and I will then work through the chat. Thank you all. Um, Joanne, on your closing thought where you were saying, wow, a lot of us look like each other, maybe think like each other, who are we missing? How is it impacting our program? Have you had any aha moments to share or like realizations or are you just beginning that journey? Yeah, thanks Emma. That's a great question. And there really are, you know, my, my hope in showing that slide is that it's a very sort of surficial um, view, which is what we often see of each other, is just some basic appearances at a glance. And um, there are certainly a lot of, of ways, and I, I certainly appreciated Charlie's presentation on neurodiversity and just the many ways that people think differently. Um, so I would say that we are starting our journey, and I totally would welcome um, input, collaboration, thoughts, concerns, or even, you know, red flags that you're seeing. Uh, we, as a program, are, are devoting time in our weekly check-ins, monthly check-ins, and, and quarterly meetings to do some learning. Um, and there's a lot, it, it just seems to be very well supported in urban community forestry nationwide um, to have resources to do that learning. Uh, we're certainly trying to be cognizant. We're also served by a 20-member council and being cognizant of, of who those voices are at the council, making sure we're listening, um, and who might like to be a voice there. So yeah, beginning, beginning steps. Okay, next question in the chat is from Jaron. Um, I think it's for Savannah. 
Um, are the average standard crown metrics previously established specifically for Vermont? So yes and no. Uh, before starting this project, we looked at other regional red pine issues um, to see what Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine have established. Um, but everybody's kind of just starting out. In Massachusetts and New Hampshire, they weren't really rating crown metrics because they had the invasive red pine scale. Um, so at that point, it was kind of too late for this. So we developed these count crown metrics using the North American Maple Project rating system. Um, and that's a foliage project that our forest health team does to rate the crowns of sugar maples. But while we're out in the field, we do it for all trees. Um, so we use that same transparency and density scale. Um, and just for time, I didn't show it today, uh, but I could share it later if you're interested. Savannah, we have three more questions for you. Yes. <laughs> uh, next, um, what wildlife species does the loss of red pine affect? So the species that are being affected are any species that like um, softwood. You could lose some deer wintering habitat. Um, a lot of bird species like to nest in these plantations. Red pine, it is argued um, about whether or not it's actually a native species. We do know that it's it survives here. Um, we have two natural stands that I know of in the state, but for the most part, it's naturalized. So it's people putting in plantations of red pine. They make great uh, telephone poles. Um, so it's not going to be a huge loss. Things animals have started to adapt to having red pine in the landscape, so it's going to affect anything that was using it, but it's not going to be a huge detrimental loss. Okay, we have another question from Charlie. I'm curious about drought with red pine. Um, some of the last few years have been fairly wet, but hot. Is the drought more temper temperature driven overall? Um, the last year, of course, was very dry. Yeah, so um, a little bit of temperature driven and a little bit of precipitation. We've actually been in a drought. Last year was pretty notable. Um, I've, Allie's on the call, I know she'll know what it was called. Um, we had a really bad regional drought where every time it rained, it was actually evaporating before the ground could take up the moisture. So even though we were having periods of rain, um, it just wasn't enough to help the trees out and really replenish that moisture bank that these trees so desperately need. Um, so it just causes more tree stress. And when a tree lets its guard down, um, it invites in a lot of insect and pathogens potentially. Okay, and last question for you, Savannah. Um, has there been any analysis of the red pine stands monoculture that I have seen in some towns or on, I think, U.S. Forest Service land and their health? Yeah, so those are those established red pine plantations. Um, the Conservation Corps notoriously planted red pines um, in municipalities as well as around watershed areas. Um, so we do have a lot of red pine in New England. Um, and we're all just starting to really see this decline. It might have been happening for the last decade or so, but it was just never really adequately assessed. Um, so we're hoping that by putting in these monitoring plots, um, we can make sure that one, we don't really see red pine scale, which we did not see at all, um, but just document this decline and maybe offer some new management objectives or different ideas for those lands. We had some other questions, but I think they've been kind of answered throughout through the chat. So I think I think that's all we have right now for the chat. If, if anybody else has questions, please feel free. I just saw that one. Um, I can keep going. So <laughs> Rutland City is planning on a harvest. I saw that email and I reached out to the um, city forester who is in charge of that management plan and I'm actually going to go down in April 
and just double checking that there's no red pine scale there. I know in his email he told the Herald News that there was red pine scale in that site. Um, however, I don't really have accurate documentation and a lot of people when they see red pine declining, they just are familiar with red pine scale and use that as a term when it may not be what's accurately there. Um, so I'm going to go down April, end of April is when the overwintering stage should be emerging and developing, so it should be noticeable. But I'm also going to sample it for our fungal pathogens as well and then reassess it in the summer before their harvest to really make sure that there's no red pine scale. And I guess the second part of his question that I didn't see was preferred method for replanting. Um, it depends on what you want, whatever your management plan is. If you want to focus on certain wildlife habitat, it's really going to be up to the landowner. Um, planting another softwood like white pine um, is native. White pine has its own slew of issues, um, but the pathogens that affect red pine can also affect white pine. So even under planting them might not um, give the best results. OK, I think I think maybe we have gotten through all of the questions. Oh. Maybe one coming in right now for you, Joanne. And then Charlie, OK. Uh, I'll start with a question for Charlie. Um, what can a &R do to better support neuro neurodivergence of our colleagues? Hey, yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm pretty new at even realizing that I am. Well, I guess I would have said I was neurodivergent if I heard the term because I knew that. But um, I guess what, what I can say speaking for myself is that a lot of times um, when someone is doing something that seems weird or rude, so, sometimes it might not be. Like I constantly doodle when I'm like in meetings, like, and it's kind of because I get overstimulated and, and I can't deal with the sensory environment. So, you know, I, I, it's, I don't want anyone to think I'm being rude when I'm doing that or um, things, things like that, I guess. And just the, the open office is challenging. I know a lot of autistic people and other neurodivergent people have challenges with too much stimulus. And, you know, ironically, maybe someone like me would be driving them, would be irritating them. But um, I think, I, you know, the reason I decided to talk about this is because I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, um, not because I, you know, want to appoint myself as an arbiter of anything um, because I'm sure there are others, but, um, just, just, I guess, um, yeah, just being, just thinking about when people react and act certain ways, what, you know, it might, it might not be what it seems to be, I guess. I don't know. Um, and just, but people have been really tolerant, you know, no one has harassed me or anything. So I guess, I don't know. Does that help at all or? Well, it hurt, helped me, so thank you. Cool. <laughs> and then uh, Joanne uh, posted in the chat that there is a guide for tree planting. So thank you for that. Cool. Yeah, definitely. It's a great question of as we consider streets without ash trees, um, which is a slightly different or quite a different scenario than entire forests without ash trees. And then, you know, looking more specifically at the species of ash trees, um, there's a lot of Great questions about, about um, which trees in urban and community areas may replace ash trees. And that has a lot of, it will have a lot to do with the site preparation, uh, space availability, and then uh, climate change. I think we're seeing more folks um, planting different warm, warmer weather species. And we're also seeing a, a you know continued prevalence of new hybrid species, and we're not exactly sure how those will roll out as they, you know, grow from being new species into 20, 30, 40 year old trees. 
Um, I'm also going to provide the link to an online version of our tree selection guide too that helps you look at site conditions and um, you know look at the space that you have for a tree and think of some good tree options for that. So I'll pass on that link in the chat too. Okay, well, I think um, I think that might be it for questions. Uh, we still have a few more minutes if you have any more, but uh, just thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you so much for the speakers who presented today. Um, very happy to have the Science Slams back and uh, thank you for joining us. And this is, is being recorded um, and it will be available um, if, if somebody missed it uh, with, and we will post that maybe later today or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Julia, too. Thanks.